responsibility of each one of us towards the environment which we have. And if we are lucky enough to be close to the countryside, then our responsibility for that. And it's a responsibility which we have to carry through, whether we're Secretary of State for the Environment or the owner of a small allotment. The truth is, each of us has a part to play. And in playing it, we play it as the partner of him who gave us that opportunity. But fourthly, we have to recognise, if we are talking about the restitution of the countryside, that it cannot be restored in a nation like ours, except within a holistic approach to the whole of our environment. I'm very conscious that the countryside cannot be protected if the towns are not protected. If you make the cities so that they are not attractive to people, so that the life, the hugger-mugger life of the town is no longer something which holds people, then the countryside cannot be protected from those who move in ever-increasing numbers with greater and greater numbers of estates out into the countryside. That's why I think the CPRE have been right to emphasize the interdependence between town and country. In the fashionable language of the United Nations, we are talking about man's footprint. And if that footprint becomes so large that it uh, covers most of the area of land which should be wild and which should be beautiful and which should be natural, even though prepared and cared for by farmer and landowner, if we do that, then we destroy what we have to hand on to the next generation. So I don't believe that we can talk about the environment as if there were a distinction between the urban environment and the rural environment, which is as sharp as most people make it. If we continue as we do, then over the next 20 years, we shall be building four and a half million new homes. I hope we can get half of those on used land in the centres of our cities. But if this goes on, that means more than two million new homes on land which is now green. And therefore, unless you are prepared to create in the centres of our cities communities which people want to live in, and where they want to bring their children up, and where they feel safe and secure and challenged, civilised, and able to fulfil themselves, unless you do that, then the damage done to the rural areas will be enormous. And of course that interdependence is also because the rural areas provide for those who are townspeople a kind of uh, opportunity, a sort of uh, refreshment without which they cannot exist. I'm very conscious of the fact that Britain is in many ways the least rural country of Europe. We went through the Industrial Revolution so long ago that most people don't have an auntie in a village. In France, everybody has an auntie in a village. There is a real connection between town and countryside. And so it's a curious thing that the countryside for most British townspeople is an idyll. The countryside for most French townspeople is a living reality. And they are aware of its untidiness they are aware of the role of the farmer. They are aware of its nature in a way in which our nation isn't. I often think people who live in the towns think of the countryside not as they knew it as a child, but as they read about it as a child. <laughs> it is the Millie Molly Mandy approach to the countryside which causes us all so much difficulty. That's why so often when they decide that it is time to retire to the countryside, <coughs> they find the noise and the smell, the smell in particular, unacceptable. They like to have the street lighting and they long for pavements. They find much of what they thought they chose to have difficult. And we very often make it more difficult because the way in which we have planned our 
villages means that they tend to move to a separate bit, specially isolated, in what is known as an executive close. <laughs> the executive close is, in my view, one of the most devastating social intrusions. It is designed, of course, to be self-sufficient. It's closed off from the rest of the village. It isn't open to anything. It is a set of executive houses. I never understand why that's supposed to be a luxurious term, but there we are. And in these houses, <coughs> people are encouraged not to be part of the village by the nature of the building. It's not surprising, too, that it's very often the person who moves into the last built of the last estate who becomes the chairman of the Preservation Society. <laughs> <laughs> Largely in order to ensure that nobody builds another estate <laughs> on the field opposite the one in which he lives. But very often, the word preservation is the word that is sought. There is little understanding of the liveliness of the village, which is crucial for its continuation. If we are to produce a countryside suitable for the next generation and that after it, then the villagers must live and not die. And that means jobs in the villages. It doesn't mean that they become merely weekending communities. Many weekenders understand that, but there are still too many who really don't understand that what matters is what happens between Monday and Friday. Otherwise, there isn't a Saturday and Sunday. And it is that difficulty which we, in a country where the rural idyll is so strong, have got particularly to overcome. In France, if you are a success, you seek to have a smart flat in the smartest arrondissement in Paris. In Britain, if you are a success, you are likely to seek an address which begins the old rectory. <laughs> this is a fundamental distinction between our nations and gives us a peculiar difficulty. For the French are in touch with the real countryside. The British tend to be in touch with their vision of the countryside. And we, who seek to protect and enhance and continue the countryside, have to turn what is very often merely a vision into a reality and keep in touch with that reality. So the Creator, our partnership with the Creator, the fact that we have a role to play, and if we don't play our role, no one else will. The interdependence between the urban and the rural areas lead us to an understanding of what a countryside is for us in the context of our Christian faith, which seems to me to be very challenging. You see, I think we have to recover a, an enthusiasm for the creation which will lead us into very dangerous paths. It is no longer possible to see what we are dealing with merely in pastoral terms. In the easy language, of the more sentimental of our poets. In the document Faith in the Countryside, which is an immensely better document than Faith in the Cities, for there is much more about faith in it. It is theologically very much more satisfactory. You will see a real attempt to come to terms with the challenges of the countryside in Christian in, in, in the Christian context. I can't possibly do justice to much of what is in there. But we drew on it heavily in the way in which the rural white paper was written. I don't think you can read that white paper without seeing that it has been shot through with a, an acceptance of our being responsible because we are part of God's creation. And I want to end by saying something about that, which is important beyond 
our concept of restoration. Why is it that we think we have a responsibility? It is because the countryside is not ours. It was given to us. It is part of God's creation and we are his partners. And because of that, we have to be very, very much more serious about what that responsibility is. You cannot be responsible unless you recognise that this is not a matter of rights, but of obligations. We have been caught up too long in the language of rights. We cannot have rights because we are created beings. We have obligations, and in our obligations to others, they find their rights. <coughs> and in others' obligations to us, we find our rights. But how different is the approach? Rights about grabbing to myself, I have a right to it. Obligations are about my responsibility towards others. And it's in the countryside, it seems to me, that we can see that at its most uh, effective. There is no countryside of the sort that we mean unless we carry through our obligations to it. And obligations are about looking after and caring for and consideration. They are about use and not abuse. They are about a protection of the abundance and not a restriction of that abundance. They are about sharing, and they are about preparing for next year too. All those are things we see in a real sense in the countryside, and sad, do not see it as easily in the town. So it may be that there is also an apostolate of the countryside, a need for those of us for whom in our daily life the reality of obligations, of responsibility, of sharing in creation are so obvious, so clear from what we see around us, from the impact that that has upon us, that perhaps we need to use our opportunities to bring that home more clearly to those for whom the streets of the city, or worse still, the avenues of the suburb, do not constantly remind of a creator, of a share in creation, of a responsibility which is unique to each one of us, of the fact that the countryside and the town are part of the same environment and mutually interdependent. Perhaps we need to lift that up together and help to bring that insight to those who do not have it on their doorstep. The language of the Gospels is filled with the images of the countryside. Many of those images are much less forceful today for those who wouldn't know what a field was to plow it or what seed was, let alone scatter it. The truth is that many of the sharpnesses of the Gospel both the wonders of the promises and, and the sharpnesses of the condemnations are weakened if we don't understand the language. We have a privilege in understanding so clearly much of that language. And I believe we also have a responsibility to carry that insight to those who are not immediately affected by it. So, the restoration of the countryside. Yes, not for ourselves alone, but for our grandchildren. Not for ourselves alone, but for the townsmen and townswomen who have not that direct uh, responsibility or that direct experience. Yes, and for the incomers who want to learn, and particularly for those who don't. <laughs> and above all, for ourselves, for it is in an appreciation of our relationship with the nature in which God manifests himself that we remember too our relationship.
relationship with his son in which he manifested himself most clearly. It is all one and the same thing. God, the creator, who offers himself and allows us to be his partner. It is the most amazing claim, and yet it is the heart of the Christian message. We are asked to share in creation, and what we are asked to share, no one else is given to do. address. Let's just be quiet for a moment and then we'll lead into uh, some spoken words. So just a couple of moments of, of quiet to collect our own thoughts uh, before uh, together we draw the threads into prayer. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful earth, particularly today for the wonderful countryside that surrounds us. Everywhere we go, we see the beautiful shapes and colours that you have created, from our fields and hedgerows, and the trees of the forest, to the pot of flowers on the windowsill. You allow us to play with your paint box of colours in our gardens, to make our own little paradise around us. And you give us the responsibility to tend the earth, to guard its delicacy, and so to reap its benefits in food for our bodies and the beauty which feeds our souls. Help us to take our responsibility seriously, to value, nurture, and respect this wonderful world, and tend it for our children and our children's children. Thank you for the abundance of nature, which spills over into everything in life. All things come from the earth, the rich, pure red of the poppies, and the sky blue of the speedwell, all appear miraculously from the brown soil. Everything we need and use comes originally from the plants, minerals, or animals that you put in this earth. We thank you for the whole beautiful rainbow of colours you have designed for and the variety of shapes and forms, and the ability to use them in our own works of art and design, to enrich the lives of ourselves and others, to help us understand life a little better, and to make everyday things beautiful. And we thank you for the gift of sight to see all the wonders you have given us. All things come from the natural world that you have provided. Please help us to preserve all your gifts and not to spoil them for selfish gain. Help us to work with nature and respect it without harming anything, that your abundant beauty may shine throughout the world and your love <coughs> be felt by all who have seen the wonders you have made. Almighty God, you have created this fruitful earth and have made us stewards of all things. Give us grateful hearts for all your goodness and steadfast wills to use your bounty well that the whole human family today and in generations to come may with us give thanks for the riches of your creation. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord who taught us to pray saying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. It is now. Are you pressed it? Yeah. You pillock you. 
Is it going near or far? Yeah, coming, zooming in. All right, now zooming away. No, I'm... Yeah. Have you got side on? S yeah. Eat your heart out, Robin Page. Yeah, eat your heart out. Now you've got to get down in the daisies, then it'll think it's a telegraph picture. It's a, it's a telegraph picture. Blue there. Blue what? Butterfly. Where? Here, flitting about. Two of them. Towards us. Is it settled? See you put it up if you stand over. This is beautiful badge, isn't it really? Is this an apparition? Is no, it's Tim, isn't it? Is it Tim? I believe it is. Just a minute, I'll see if I recognise yes, those legs, yes. Gascoigne. <laughs> ga yeah. Gascoigne, eat your heart out. Yeah, yeah Gascoigne. So what do you call? I went last night. I've been to about three or four matches already, haven't I? Yeah. Spain. That's it. Coaching is the oak tree planted. It's the only one that's going well. As you can see, he's very proud of this oak. Yeah, look at that. No, he's not doing anything on the oak tree. He's just, he's just, look at that for a forge. Look at that. I think we'll bring the spinner back on. <laughs> They're always, like a lot of butterflies, they, once they settle, they fold the wings. The badger's just discovered a common blue. There it is. Now perhaps he'll disturb it and we can see it fly away. There we are. Gone. Sorry, lost it. Here yeah, well, I'm right on the very edge of Telegraph Field. Unfortunately going into the sun, swinging around. This is Tim's winter or spring barley or some cereal anyway. It's barley. Badger the expert says it's <laughs> barley. Yeah. It's barley. Swinging round now. Leaving our trust land and swinging round to see the typical agricultural policies of today. Typical Pemberton land. Acres as far as the eye can see. And acres as far as the eye can see. Look at that. Green barley. Not broken up for two miles. There we are. And swinging round. Over the other side is Robin's uh, Robin's land where. He Grazes his sheep. There's the margin that uh, Mr. Pemberton gets paid for. The Countryside Commission and back full circle. And there are some of the pollarded um, willows that were uh, done by the uh, National Rivers Authority a couple of months ago. Beautiful. And the oxide daisies. You are an odd child, you really are. 
Bob Ike, right? people from Stafford, is that right? I would come down from Stafford. Yeah, that's lovely. No, no.